Welcome to the Insightful Professor. Today we begin an examination of normalization theory. Normalization theory was introduced by E.F. Codd at the time that he was presenting the relational model, the theory of relational database. Normalization theory has practical application. Normalization has been used in the design of operating system files and databases. It can be used in both a bottom-up methodology and a top-down approach. In our presentation, we'll follow Cod's discussion of first, second, and third normal form. The objectives of this presentation include introducing normalization theory, explaining the principles of functional dependency, discussing why normalization is important in an effort to achieve a stable database design, presenting a description of the various normal forms, as we said, we'll be covering first, second, and third normal form in this video, and also the normalization process, how we move from one normal form to a higher normal form. We will discuss some of the anomalies that may motivate bringing a database from a lower normal form to a higher normal form. And we'll demonstrate how normalization is used as a process to decompose a table or a relation which has anomalies into a table or set of tables or set of relations that eliminate these anomalies. When transforming an ER model into a set of relations or tables, Typically, what we have is a set of well-structured relations. However, there's no guarantee that all anomalies will have been removed during that transformation process. So normalization is a formal process for deciding which attributes should be grouped together in a table or relation so that all anomalies have been removed. This is what we mean by a well-structured relation. They would be devoid of anomalies. Normalization theory, as we had mentioned in our introduction, evolved from Codd's research in relational database. Effectively, what it does is it serves to provide a definition of what constitutes a good database design. So this theory is a formalization of what might be kind of the intuition of some database designer that just says this this seemed right but perhaps can't ex explain the reason that it seems right or why another table structure might seem incorrect so it's a formal process normalization is applicable to any database management system not just relational systems furthermore it has been used historically in designing operating system files, something that is not a database. So normalization as a process involves raising a table from a lower normal form to a higher normal form. It's a process of decomposition. We go from the extreme case of being unnormalized to first normal form, second normal form, and finally to third normal form. With each step, we reduce the possibility of errors or anomalies occurring during a database update process. The goal is to reduce the relations with anomalies to smaller, well-structured relations. So normalization is actually a semantic notion. It requires an understanding of the meaning of the data items. Note that while Entity relationship models initially focus on entities. The normalization process focuses on attributes. So normalization is often used in a bottom-up approach to design a database. However, it has application in a top-down approach, which is what we follow in developing an entity relationship model. Its application in that context is to do validation in terms of the composition of the resulting tables. So a normal form is said to be a state 
of a relation or table that requires that certain rules regarding relationships between the data items or attributes are satisfied. A relation that is in a higher normal form is closer to achieving the status of being well structured. With each transformation from a lower normal form to a higher normal form, we eliminate or at least reduce the likelihood of an anomaly occurring through some kind of data manipulation operation. So the main goals of normalization include minimizing data redundancy, which by itself can reduce the likelihood of anomalies occurring, but also can contribute to a reduction in the amount of storage that would be used. Another goal is to simplify the enforcement of referential integrity constraints. Furthermore, normalization can make it easier to maintain data, insert, update, or delete, because it's through these operations that anomalies can occur. So if we reduce the likelihood of anomalies or eliminate the possibility of anomalies through these DML operations, then the maintain, uh, maintenance of the data will be more achievable. And finally, it, normalization can provide a better, in the sense of being more stable, type of design that is an improved representation of the real world. After all, when we create files or database tables, what we're really doing is coming up with a representation of objects within the application domain. From time to time, it may be necessary for these objects to adapt to changes in business requirements. And that's what we're talking about when we refer to stability. So normalization makes no assumptions about the way the data will be used. It's not concerned with how data will be accessed or queried, nor is it a concern for how it will be rendered in displays or reports. In fact, normalization places no constraints on how data can or should be stored. It's strictly a semantic notion. Now, a normalized design has potential trade-offs. The primary benefit would be that we achieve a stable design. We reduce the likelihood or possibility of update anomalies. But there's a cost associated with it. Remember, we had said that normalization entails concept of decomposition. You're taking one table or relation and creating multiple tables or relations from that. So you're storing the same data that you might have stored in one table in now multiple tables. And therefore, when someone needs all of that data, it will be necessary to bring the two tables contents back together through some kind of an operation such as a join. But a spin-off advantage also appears. The, it requires an understanding of the data semantics, which forces the designer to effectively communicate with the business users or domain experts. So the notion of a stable design is effectively analogous to the notion of well-structuredness, central to the notion of first, second, and third normal form, is the concept of functional dependence. The way we can define this is we say that given some relation R, the attribute Y of R is said to be functionally dependent on another attribute, attribute X, of the same relation R, if and only if each value of x has associated with it precisely one value of y at any point in time. Our notation uses this arrow to say that the attribute x of r, r dot x, functionally determines the attribute y of r, r dot y. Note that here we're saying x is an attribute, y is an attribute. However, it's possible that both x and y could represent a set of x attributes. Uh, 
That is, x and y could be composite. Another way to phrase this, which might be easier to grasp the concept, is to say, if you tell me the value of x, then I can tell you the value of y. Note that a functional dependency is not a mathematical dependency. That is, if x functionally determines y, it does not mean that y can be computed from the value of x. It simply means that if you know the value of x, there can be only one value for y. Let's look at a few examples to make this point clearer. If you tell me the value of student number, I can tell you the name of the student. If you tell me the value of student number, I can tell you the age of the student. The idea here is that student number functionally determines student name. Student number functionally determines student age. In the case of course number and course name, Consider that I'm currently teaching a course with the course number CSC341. In the university catalog, each course is listed with a unique course number. If you ask for the name, the C name value, for the course, it has the name of Database and Information Management. Thus, given the course number, CSC341, we can determine precisely the name of the course. We have an additional couple of examples at the bottom of this slide that show the notion of multiple attributes. That is, if you tell me the combination of name and address, if you tell me the values of these two things, then I can determine the age. If you tell me the course number and section number, I can tell you the room that, say, a class might be scheduled. So again, x and y could be sets of values. If all of this sounds very familiar, it comes back to the idea of candidate keys, something we have discussed in the notion of database design. So if a field uniquely identifies every other field in a given table, it is a candidate key. But another way of expressing this notion, using what we've just talked about in terms of functional dependence, we could say that if every field in a table is functionally dependent on some field, say k, then k is a candidate key. An example from an insurance application would say, suppose we had a table that consisted of a column called policy number, policy type, name, and address. Assuming that there's a functional dependency where policy number functionally determines policy type, policy number functionally determines name, policy number functionally determines address, then we have a situation where policy number is this field k that we just suggested that functionally determines all of the other columns. Therefore, we can conclude that policy number is a candidate key. It could serve to identify uniquely a row within the policy table. So a candidate key is an attribute or combination of attributes that uniquely identifies a row in a table or relation. Given its value, we can determine the values of all the other attributes. Now, a candidate key has to satisfy two properties. First, a candidate key must provide unique identification. For every row, the value of the key must uniquely identify that row within a table. Second, non-redundancy. No attribute in the key can be deleted without destroying the property of unique identification.
This also goes by the name of the principle of minimality. So effectively, the key consists of all those attributes that, when combined, serve to uniquely identify all remaining attributes. But we don't have any more than what we need. We have just the right amount. So the first property implies that each non-key attribute is functionally dependent on that key. Additionally, because a candidate key serves as a method of identification, it follows that the candidate key cannot be null. So ideally, a candidate key for a relation should not change value over time. When designing a database and designing tables for that database, the designer will have to designate one of the candidate keys as the primary key. If there's only one candidate key for the table, it becomes the primary key. But it's possible that some tables could have multiple candidate keys. It's like holding an election. You have multiple candidates for the office. And then based upon some voting or some decision, what happens is we determine that one of the candidates becomes the primary key. Following Codd's notation of listing within parentheses the attributes that define a relation or table, we underline whatever attribute or combination of attributes serve as the primary key. So in this example, policy number is underlined because based upon it satisfying the requirement of a candidate key, functionally determining all of the other attributes, and being the only candidate key, it gets designated as the primary key. Note that there's nothing special about this notation. It's just a simple way to enumerate the columns of a table and to identify the column or columns that serve as the primary key. So in this particular situation, what we have is policy number is what we'll call an atomic primary key. It consists of just one column. Sometimes a candidate key is composite. In this example, we have information about a scheduled offering of a course, a class. To uniquely identify who's teaching the class, we need a combination of the course number and the section number. To uniquely identify the room where the class will be taught, we also need course number and section number. And likewise for the time, so we have multiple attributes that serve as the candidate key and subsequently, in this case, as the primary key. So the reason for the composite key is due to the fact that there could be more than one class scheduled for a course in any given semester. Course number by itself will be insufficient to uniquely identify one row that describes a class. It is sometimes the case that a table can have more than one candidate key. In our example here, we're describing employee, and each employee has a unique employee number which serves to functionally determine all of the remaining attributes. Each employee also has a unique social security number, which again functionally determines all remaining attributes. So there are two candidate keys, employee number by itself and social security number by itself. The designer must choose one of these as the primary key. Sometimes the decision is arbitrary. In other cases, it might be for practical reasons. For example, employee number, if it's the primary key in one table, could appear as a foreign key in another table and then be used by many different people as they write queries to form joins of the tables. So therefore, if we had chosen social security number, social security number would be required as a foreign key in another table and have to be supplied by many people as they write queries. Given the sensitive nature of social security number, it makes more sense to use the employee number as the primary key 
in this example. Note that while there can be multiple candidate keys for a table or relation, there can be only a single primary key. As noted in the previous slide, the key could be composite, that is, it could consist of more than one column. Finally, we get to normalization itself. First normal form. First normal form essentially states that all column values are atomic. That is, there are no repeating groups. Notice that in this table, we record information about a student named Sally, who has a student number of 111. Sally is a CS major, and Sally has registered for three different classes. She registered for course number 66.10, she registered for course number 64.25, and she also registered for course number 66.11. Each course registration is indicated by a separate row. If there were a repeating group, then a single container, say a single column within a row, would have included multiple values, all three of these values. That goes against our notion here of disallowing repeating groups. In order to achieve first normal form, it's as simple as being able to present all data in a table with atomic values for each column. Thus, this table gives us first normal form. There are no repeating groups. But notice there's something less than desirable about the way the data would be stored here. The facts that Sally has a student number of 111 and that Sally majors in CIS are recorded multiple times. The point then is there is data redundancy here due to the duplication. Additionally, information about courses, such as course number 66.10, having a name of DBMS, that appears multiple times in this table. These facts are all recorded multiple times. So what's the concern or the problem with this? If something needs to change, it has to be changed in multiple rows. So whenever there's data redundancy, the concern that we have is a fact is stored more than once, we have to change all occurrences of that fact in order to achieve consistency within the database. Within first normal form, we have three possible anomalies that can arise. There's an insertion anomaly. Note that we could not add a new student unless the student has registered for her course. We could not add a new course without a student having registered for it. I encourage you to take a look at that table structure and confirm this point. We have an update anomaly. A change in major for either Sally or Joe requires updating multiple rows due to this data duplication. A change to the course name for course number 66.10 has to be applied to more than one row. We also see a deletion anomaly as a possibility. If Sally withdraws from the school, we have to remove all rows about Sally, and what we would be removing is information about course 66.11. Let's go back for a moment and show this. Notice that course 66.11 occurs in only one row, a row where Sally is the student who is registered. If we remove information about Sally, that row would be removed, and hence there would be no record or indication of the existence of a course 66.11 named history. Let's move on to another problem. Another problem occurs when we have a composite primary key and we experience a situation where another attribute depends on only 
part of the key, not the entire key. Assuming we have a functional dependency in this table that says the combination of name and address serve to identify person age, and a functional dependency that says address by itself serve to identify building age, then what happens is the combination of name and address would serve to identify person age, and using that combination, we could also identify building age. The reason is that address taken by itself would suffice to identify building age. But notice that building age does not depend on the entire key. It does not depend on name and address, but it depends only upon the address. So it is referred to as a partial dependency. So a non-key field, right, building age is not part of a key. A non-key field is only partially dependent on a key if it, is, if it is not functionally dependent on the entire key. So the functional dependency of address determining building age means the non-key field of building age depends only on part of the key. This is a problem. As we go to second normal form, we're going to talk more about this partial dependency. A table is said to be in second normal form if it satisfies the requirement of being in first normal form, plus no partial dependencies exist. So notice with Codd's definition here, we don't just come up with a definition that says this is second normal form, but it's necessary to first have a definition of first normal form because second normal form is defined based on first normal form. Now, in order to convert the table to second normal form, it's necessary to eliminate the partial dependency. So the process involves two steps. One, is to use the partial key as the key of a new table. And second, to remove fields that depend on that partial key from the original table and place them in the new table. So we had started with the combination of name and address being the primary key. However, the functional dependency said that address functionally determines building age all by itself. That's the partial dependency. So what we want to do is we want to eliminate this partial dependency because address when taken by itself functionally determines the age. What we do is we take address and put that into a new table and then we remove age from the original table and place that into the new table. So the original table now becomes name, address, and person age, and we've eliminated from that table the partial dependency. The new table contains the remaining information. But notice in order to produce some data that had the name, address, person age, and building age, we need to access both tables, and we need to access this in such a way that we can reunite the data that we removed from the original table and placed into table two. This would be based upon connecting the address column, which appears in both tables. So we're able to reconstruct the original set of data so that means we have not lost any information by taking the original table and decomposing it into two tables. So the decomposition process then is said to be a non-loss decomposition. The original table can be reconstructed by using an SQL operation referred to as a join. Why is this necessary? It's necessary because if we don't satisfy second normal form and we retain that partial dependency, we experience anomalies. First, an update anomaly. If four people live at the same address, the same building age would be recorded four times. Right? Because building age 
is recorded for each combination of name and address. But it would be the same building age for all four residents of the building. So we have data duplication. The consequence is if we need to update that age, we have to update it multiple times. And if we fail to update it every time it's stored, we have possible integrity problems, inconsistency of our data. An insertion anomaly is also a possibility. Every entry in a table must have a primary key. So therefore, if the primary key required a combination of name and address, we would have problems inserting information about new buildings. The address and building age of a building could not be recorded in the database unless there was a person living in the building. Finally, a deletion anomaly. If every person living at a given address leaves that address, then all rows for those people would be removed, but we would also be removing information about that address, including its building age. So therefore, there would be no information about that address recorded in the table. These problems all go away once we put the tables into second normal form. And when we eliminate the partial dependency, I'll leave it to you to confirm that we no longer have those three anomalies. Another possible problem that can occur is what's called a transitive dependency. Assume that a table with two or more non-key fields exists. And here we're calling it table T, and we have employee number, employee name, department, and location. Employee number functionally determines all of the remaining attributes. Therefore, it's a candidate key and subsequently could become the primary key of this table. Also assume that there's another functional dependency. If you tell me the department number or the department name, I can tell you the location of the department. Therefore, location is a non-key field, but also department is a non-key field. And we have a non-key field that functionally determines another non-key field. This is referred to as a transitive dependency. Our definition of third normal form now says that a table is in third normal form if it satisfies the requirements of second normal form and we do not have any transitive dependencies. So again, observe that the definition of third normal form refers to a lesser or earlier normal form. Okay, the location then is dependent on the key and also on the non-key field of department. That's the transitive dependency. To achieve third normal form, what we do is again follow two steps. We eliminate the transitive dependency by first creating a new table with the non-key field that functionally determines the other non-key field as the key of the new table, and we remove the functionally determined non-key field from the original table and place it in a new table. So remember our problem existed here with department being a non-key field and it functionally determined location of another non-key field. We take department and make it the key of a new table and we remove location from the original table and place it in the new table. Now the original table consists of only employee number, employee name, and department. This again is a non-loss decomposition because we can reconstruct the original information by taking the department value in the second table and matching it to the department in the first, performing a join operation, and we can reconstruct the original table we've not lost any information. We also avoid possible anomalies. Let's explain what those anomalies are if we retain the transitive dependency. First, 
what we would have is an update anomaly. If 50 employees are employed within a given department, the location of the department would be recorded 50 times. Data duplication, and we've explained what that problem is. Insertion anomaly. Because every entry in a table must have a key value, an entry in a table T cannot be made without a value for employee number. This means that we could not record information about a department and its location unless currently we had an employee that was assigned to that department. A deletion anomaly. If every employee in a given department quits or is fired, the corresponding rows are deleted from the table. We lose information because we would be losing information about departments and the locations of those departments. But we overcome this problem by eliminating the transitive dependency and creating the two tables. And again, it is a non-loss decomposition. So in this video, we introduced normalization theory. We explained the principles of functional dependencies. We discuss reasons why normalization is important to achieve a stable database design. We presented a concise description of first normal form, second normal form, and third normal form, the three normal forms attributed to EF COD. We described the normalization process, basically how to move from a lower normal form to a higher normal form. We said that this was achieved through a decomposition process. We discussed some anomalies that exist when tables or relations store information about multiple objects and store multiple facts. And we indicated why these were problems. We then demonstrated how normalization is used to decompose a relation with anomalies into relations that eliminate the anomalies. In a future video, we'll address advanced normal forms going beyond first, second, and third normal form. If you found this video informative, give us a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel to show your support and also to be notified when we post future videos. And once again, thanks for watching. Thank you.